Leaks are an unavoidable reality of the modern video game landscape. Despite the game industry's obsession with secret keeping, piercings of the veil continue to happen, and it's these moments that I'll be examining in this video. I've been looking back at some of the strangest, most significant, and in some cases most shocking stories of video game leaks. How did these leaks happen? Who was responsible? And what can we learn from the stories behind them? I attempted to find out. From corporate slip-ups to malicious hacks, we're going to explore the wide spectrum of gaming's biggest leaks and discover just how far some have been willing to go in the pursuit of secret information. In this edition, of Game History Secrets. While being far from the most egregious example this video will dissect, our first case sits somewhere among the most cited in the pantheon of bizarre video game leaks. Tomb Raider enjoyed a renaissance of sorts throughout the 2010s, starting with the 2013 reboot and continuing with its sequel, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Both games attained critical acclaim and commercial success, creating expectations for a third instalment to build upon the foundations of the first two and close out Lara Croft's expanded origin story. After Rise of the Tomb Raider's release in November 2015, Square Enix was understandably quiet on the possibility of a sequel. Fans of the series were not expecting word on a third game for some time to come, but less than a year after Rise, one man's chance encounter with someone involved in its development would pull back the curtain almost two whole years before it would eventually release. Yeah, so I, um, I live in Montreal uh, for uh, over about, uh, let's say, 10 years now. Um, really passionate about video games has been my my big passion uh, since I'm a was a teenage uh, teenage boy. This is Tripler280, a game industry alumnus who previously worked for a major publisher. Back in 2016 though, he was simply a fan of video games and a bystander minding his own business in the city of Montreal, Canada. On a cold morning in October 2016, Tripler was riding the subway to work when something caught his eye. I was going to work. I was in a subway, uh, standing there. You know, everyone is doing their 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 own stuff, minding their own business. And uh, there was a guy uh, sitting um, next to me uh, with his laptop open. So I was a little bit surprised. I was like, okay, someone is, is working right now or doing stuff. And I just looked over my shoulder and um, I saw um, the guy working on a PowerPoint presentation. First thing I saw was Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So straight away in my head, I was like, hmm, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Like I play video games and I was like, I don't recall a game called Shadow of the Tomb Raider. As a fan of the Tomb Raider games, Tripler was intrigued. He attempted to read some of this slideshow, open for the whole carriage to see, and he could just make out some of the details. It appeared to be discussing the psychology of video game players. Knowing that there was a chance he had just stumbled upon an unannounced game, he tried to capture the moment to show his friends. I just decided to grab my phone, but I was so nervous that I <laughs> just tried to take a picture, like sneaky. Um... In his haste, Tripler made off with only one image. It was a little blurry, but the main takeaway, the logo for this apparent game, was clearly visible. He sent it to a couple of friends and then decided it was time to let the internet know. He uploaded it to Imgur and posted it to Reddit's r slash PS4 board, where it quickly gained momentum. Some were skeptical of his story, suggesting it was a joke or maybe even an intentional leak to drum up hype, although the vast majority of posters believed it. Soon the theory took shape that this was indeed the third game in the Tomb Raider Survivor trilogy. Not only that, but fans had also worked out that it was likely being made by Eidos Montreal, since Tripler had mentioned where the photo was taken. In the hours after the post went viral, Kotaku followed up on the story and they were able to confirm with their own sources that it was legitimate. Picking up the reins from Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal was the main developer of the next game, which was called Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Tripler really had come across confidential internal documents for the next Tomb Raider on his morning commute. For a time, he feared legal retaliation from the publisher, but in the end never heard from them, nor did they attempt to get the image pulled. 
Yeah, after I posted uh, this, uh, I, I felt really bad. I was like, oh my God, is um, he's going to lose his job or, you know, I was um, feeling bad uh, about that. Can can Edos or like Crystal Dynamics come back to me and sue me because I leaked that or, or well, there was a lot of questions. And even after <laughs> six years, I'm still wondering, like, uh, to be honest, if it's a good idea to, to talk with you, to be honest. I'm like, is there any, I'm not really familiar with all the legal stuff. It wasn't until over 16 months later in March 2018 that the project was officially revealed, retaining the title witnessed on the Montreal subway. The game was released on the 14th of September 2018. The Shadow of the Tomb Raider leak raised many questions, and although it was eventually confirmed to be true, some of those still remain today, such as the identity of the person Triplet encountered, and why they were so lax about exposing confidential material to a carriage full of commuters. As we spoke more about the incident, we both settled upon a theory as to why this could have happened. I guess maybe if the presentation was about, I don't know, the psychological aspect of video game, Maybe it's an, I don't know, an external partner, someone who was going to do a presentation, maybe someone who is not really familiar with how con confidential a, a game can be. I'm pretty sure that, you know, everyone who works on the video game industry, that's the, the one, the first thing that we, uh, we tell you is, is that, you know, don't start talking about games outside of the job with, you know, people with your, uh, uh, with your friends or your wife, your husband, etc. Just um, keep it to yourself. Maybe it was an outside consultant, you know, kind of speculate. But but that would be the type of person who might not have had impressed upon them the importance of industry secrets, you know. If you are someone exactly. who isn't versed in this world and doesn't understand how important these trade secrets are, then you might slip up and show someone a, on a, a train. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Across the world, it is a common practice for a select number of people at retailers and online stores to receive confidential information about upcoming games. For instance, a game publisher may choose to inform a store about an unannounced title so they can prepare their internal infrastructure to receive pre-orders and offer information on this new product. Occasionally, accidents have been known to happen, where info will mistakenly be published ahead of time, preempting an official announcement, but rarely have these leaks been as extensive as one which occurred in May 2018. Just less than one month before E3 2018 was due to take place, fans were keeping a close eye out for any potential leaks when Twitter user Wario64 seemingly hit the motherload. Scanning for upcoming releases on Walmart Canada's website, Wario64 had found a myriad of what appeared to be unannounced games listed on their system. Among these were Just Cause 4, Borderlands 3, LEGO DC Villains, Splinter Cell, Gears of War 5, and Rage 2. Some made more sense than others, indicating that some of the listings contained errors. For example, Forza Horizon 5 was listed when Forza Horizon 4 had still yet to be announced at the time. Dragon Quest 2 was another anomaly, which was clearly supposed to have been the then upcoming Dragon Quest Builders 2. Errors like this added a modicum of doubt to what otherwise seemed like a set of genuine leaked games. Which among them were errors and which were titles that truly existed became the subject of much discussion in the days that followed, but the general consensus was that Walmart Canada had just kicked off the E3 season with a huge leak. Bethesda, the publisher behind Rage 2, chose to get ahead of the news later that day and began poking fun at Walmart Canada for the slip-up. The official Rage Twitter account shared an annotated screenshot of the Rage 2 placeholder listing, making light of what had happened. Bethesda's Pete Hines followed up with a tweet of his own saying, This is why we can't have nice things. As the month of May went on, more and more games from the list were officially announced, like Just Cause 4 and LEGO DC Supervillains, wiping away any doubts that Walmart Canada had published some genuine information. 
But how exactly did this happen? I spoke to Riley Little, the person behind Walmart Canada's official gaming Twitter account, for some more information. Here's what he had to say. I think it was genuinely just an accident after the team had been briefed on the upcoming software. It was when there were active E3 pre-order incentives, usually some money off, and the listings were created and someone who hadn't been informed on why the portals were prepped accidentally set them to go live early. As E3 eventually rolled around, it became clear that the vast majority of titles listed were real, with a couple of exceptions like Splinter Cell. Walmart Canada became the subject of many jokes at the expo as a result of the incident. During Bethesda's E3 conference, Pete Hines decided to take a few more shots at the store for their mistake. So, we're starting with a game that we announced a few weeks ago through our friends at Walmart Canada. <laughs> perhaps best known for their low prices and ability to keep a secret. <laughs> In the end though, it was Walmart Canada itself that had the last laugh, as they were able to leverage the infamous incident as social media fodder. In the run-up to Rage 2's launch, they jokingly advertised an exclusive pre-order bonus sleeve for the game in the style of the placeholder art that had once spoiled its announcement. Super Smash Bros. Nintendo's crossover fighting series has a long and painstakingly documented history of leaks and rumours. With so much hype and intrigue around each entry, fans have devoted countless hours to tracking down new information on upcoming games and theorising about what is to come. Few of these leaks, however, can rival the enormity of one which took place in August 2014. At the time, fans were anticipating the release of Super Smash Bros. for the Wii U and 3DS. The 3DS version was due to release first on September 14th, 2014, which was only a few weeks away. A handful of characters for the game had yet to be revealed at this point, which was cause for considerable hype and speculation. Then, on the 19th of August 2014, the leak slowly began to surface. A user on 4chan's V-Board started a thread which included a collage of all the playable characters confirmed to be featured in the game at the time, as well as every other playable character which had appeared in a previous Smash Bros. game. They asked the community which of the fighters from previous games did they think would not make the final cut. The speculation went on for some hours, until later in the day when another user took the original collage image and posted their own edits of it in a new thread. The image they posted crossed out a selection of characters from previous games such as Snake and Lucas, but also added new, never-before-seen icons for unannounced fighters like Dark Pit and Shulk. Mewtwo, on the other hand, had a question mark over him. While many were dismissive of this initial post, fuel would be added to the fire by another poster going under the alias Mother Fucking Leaker. This person shared two off-screen images of Super Smash Bros. for the 3DS containing unannounced characters. The first showed the full render of the Duck Hunt character, while the second showed the complete character select screen. As time went on, some additional images were shared by another poster, including looks at the stage select screen and renders for Dr. Mario and Shulk. Then, three other images surfaced on Smashboards in the following hours, courtesy of a user named MasterLinkX. These showed some more of Shulk, including a shot of the character in-game. The veracity of these pictures soon became a source of considerable contention among the Smash fanbase. Further adding to the confusion was the fact that Masterlink X, the third source, admitted to doctoring their images. For instance, they edited Shulk using a render from Xenoblade Chronicles and changed the wireless disabled text to say disablad rather than disabled. They did this to sow doubt among the community as to how real the images were. I caught up with Masterlink years later, who offered this explanation. Quote, I was going to photoshop the images here and there, and share them publicly once they eventually started leaking as they did. Why do this? I was bored and thought it would have been funny to see people start seeing different versions of images and start questioning what the hell was going on. The stuff started leaking publicly faster than I was expecting, so I never really got to photoshop more of the images before they were all posted by the 4chan user. 
In the immediate aftermath of these leaks, the debate over their authenticity raged on across forums and social media, with the vast majority of people believing it was all a hoax. One battleground for the discourse was GameFAQs, where users were polled after the initial leaks and voted mostly against it being real. Out of 158 people, 49 voted no and 44 voted leaning no. Just 9 people said that they believed it completely. Over on NeoGAF, there was a similar level of doubt leveled towards the leaks. To show you some examples, if this is real, then there's no way it's the final roster. There's some spots I know Sakurai and his wife would never accept as UI designers. Are people seriously contemplating that this might be real? What is wrong with you? This is obviously fake for me. You guys are fooled easily. I don't know why, but I'm genuinely frustrated that so many people are falling for this. Guys, this leak is so obviously fake. How would they even make an amiibo of Duck Hunt? It's obviously fake because of that alone. Reasons for believing the images were inauthentic varied. For example, some believe that the character select screen shown couldn't be real because it sported some key differences from the version of it shown at E3 2014 months earlier. Another popular recurring theory suggested that the design of Shulk was forged using the previously revealed render for Little Mac. Some even attempted to overlay the two designs to prove their point, which would later become a point of ridicule and an infamous meme in the community. Much of the doubt would be quelled, however, on the 25th of August 2014, when a series of videos was uploaded to YouTube by a user named Is That True? Whereas the still images posted previously were commonly dismissed as fake, even the most ardent skeptics struggled to explain away these videos that showed the game in motion. The unannounced characters previously shown in other posts like Bowser Jr. could now be seen in these off-camera recordings of in-game footage. This represented a turning point for the Smash community as a lot more fans became convinced that this outpouring of leaks was legitimate, although a good amount of people remained unconvinced. Some touted the theory that this was a mod of Super Smash Bros. Brawl for the Wii made solely for the purpose of orchestrating an elaborate ruse. As the day went on and the game's press began covering the leaks, Nintendo of America took action and removed the videos, all but confirming their authenticity. The final nail in the coffin was delivered several days later, on August 29th, when a Japanese Nintendo Direct ad which opened with a trailer officially revealing Shulk for the game. His look, animations and moveset were identical to those seen in the leaked material, putting the matter largely to rest. All told, the series of images and videos leaked a whopping total of 8 unannounced fighters for the game, along with stages, trophies and other details. This was a breach of confidential material on a scale that had never been seen before in the history of the series. So, how did this monumental leak occur? Over the years, there have been plenty of rumours and theories without a definitive answer. I decided to look into it. The most common summation made about the leaks at the time was that they had some connection to America's content rating board, the ESRB. This is due to the player's 3DS username seen in the leaked material, which was ESRB0083. It is widely known that the ESRB views pre-release content like this as games are being prepared for launch. Publishers can use this opportunity to negotiate changes to their games to obtain lower age ratings and seek advice from them on how to do so. Among the bevy of leaked material was some content that didn't make it into the final game, such as a trophy for Fire Emblem's Thalia, who is sporting some fairly revealing attire. This has been cited in the past as further evidence to suggest these images had some kind of connection to the ESRB. It has therefore become commonly referred to as the ESRB leak. But how deserved is this moniker? I spoke to several former ESRB employees who worked there at the time the leaks took place, including people who oversaw Nintendo games, to gain insight into whether or not these could have originated from the organisation. The consensus among them was that this couldn't have possibly come from the ESRB itself. The ESRB, I was told, employs very high levels of security when testing or viewing content from unreleased games. All content is viewed in a tightly controlled environment where no phones or other recording devices are permitted. 
testers within these facilities are monitored at all times by security personnel and no testers are allowed to leave the room with the unreleased content. In some cases, publishers even send their own security staff to transport this confidential material in secured containers. In other words, it wouldn't have been possible for someone at the ESRB to take material from Smash Bros. 3DS into a quiet dark room and capture it on a phone. With that established, I spoke to former employees from Nintendo of America, including some who had worked on Super Smash Bros. for 3DS. Nintendo of America employ staff who are responsible for capturing videos from their games for the ESRB to evaluate. It is common for the ESRB to review footage of in-development games sent by publishers as opposed to playing them first-hand. A couple of workers were doubtful that the footage could have been filmed inside Nintendo's offices themselves, but I eventually found developers who recalled this specific incident and had knowledge of how it happened. According to them, the leaks were connected to a Nintendo of America employee whose duties included localization and ESRB compliance, although they were not the person responsible for posting the content on the internet. It was actually a child of this Nintendo employee who apparently gained access to the material through a personal device. The exact nature of how this was accomplished is unclear, but one former staffer believed that they could have accessed Nintendo's intranet using a device belonging to their parent without their knowledge. They then recorded the off-screen footage and took pictures on a phone at home. This explains why they were able to do so in a dark, quiet room unnoticed, as well as the appearance of the footage seen in the video. We can see that it is clearly not being played on a retail 3DS, as there is no gap between the top and bottom screens. Former workers say that the footage was originally captured using Nintendo's proprietary capture technology partner CTR. We were all shocked to hear about the news of the leak when it happened, one source told me. They allege that Nintendo was quick to trace the source of the leak back to the employee involved, and they were soon fired. After all, they would have been able to see who accessed which files on their intranet were that the case, and the ESRB number seen in the footage could have also helped. However, there's still more to the story than that. Although the child of this ex-Nintendo employee was allegedly responsible for it originally escaping the company, they do not appear to have been the person who posted the content to 4chan. In actuality, what appears to have happened is that they obtained the material for a small group of online friends. In the middle of August 2014, the original leaker shared their discoveries with this tight-knit circle of Smash diehards under the proviso they would not share it with the rest of the world, first the images and then later the videos. But the secret was too big for some to keep. They slightly shared it with a couple of their friends, they did the same, until it reached someone who couldn't be trusted to keep it quiet. Not long after this, those initial icons emerged on 4chan, and other people with access to more of the images decided that the pact of secrecy had expired and posted what they had. This wasn't a rogue Nintendo employee seeking internet points. These were the actions of a fan who was unable to wait a few weeks for the official release and leaked it to their online buddies at the expense of their parents' career and Nintendo's marketing plans. Most big video game companies employ reasonably high levels of security to keep their work under wraps. CCTV cameras, biometric locks on doors, sometimes even guards. But have you ever wondered what would happen if someone just tried walking into one of these places? Well, in 2015, that is exactly what happened to a studio in Ontario, Canada. Digital Extremes is the developer behind the online multiplayer action game Warframe. At the time of the incident, the company was also early into development on a top secret new IP alongside content for Warframe. No information about this project had made its way online until their headquarters was paid a visit by an uninvited guest. In June 2015, a fan of Digital Extremes decided that they would travel to their building in London, Ontario and attempt to enter it. After taking some time to pinpoint the exact location of the studio, the person in question eyed a statue of a Warframe character in an office window. They then scoped out the entrance before noticing that it was locked with a fingerprint scanner, but that didn't stop them. They waited for a Digital Extremes worker to unlock the door and then followed in behind them. 
This person then walked through the building and found a place to sit down, alternating chairs every so often in an attempt to appear busy as they observed the working day around them. None of the company's actual employees questioned them. It was assumed since they were in the building that they had a valid reason for being there, and with the company employing hundreds of people, new faces were not uncommon. After spending some time there throughout the morning, the intruder then followed a group of employees lining up at midday for lunch. They grabbed themselves a plate and enjoyed a free buffet lunch courtesy of Digital Extremes. The imposter sat and ate their food with a friendly group of developers and listened as they described an unannounced project they were working on. It was a multiplayer first person shooter with card game elements that was codenamed Keystone. After this, the individual continued wandering the offices and hung around for about six more hours. Recounting the experience at a later date, they said, quote, The QA room has Funko figures and stuffed animals everywhere. There were a lot of PS4 and Xbox One sitting around unattended. There were no security guards and no one asked me who I was. They just assumed I belonged there and told me about their secret game. At 6pm, they noticed people leaving and followed them out, once again blending into the crowd. This person had just spent the whole day trespassing inside their offices, and Digital Extremes was none the wiser. That was until a thread appeared on the subreddit for Warframe, relaying the details of the incident and revealing Project Keystone. The company's secret was now out in the open. It was posted by an anonymous user calling themselves Undercover Legend, who clearly expected the story to be received much more positively than it actually was. At first, a lot of people didn't believe them, and the few that did labelled the act as creepy. It wasn't until the post was removed for privacy reasons and Kotaku verified the story independently that it became clear they were telling the truth. One day later, their community manager discussed the debacle on the official Warframe forums. Quote, A recent claim from a fan circulating the web alleges he or she spent a day with us incognito. Well, Canadians are known for being welcoming and polite. We employ over 200 passionate gamers committed to delivering kick-ass games like Warframe and Sword Coast Legends. And while we're flattered someone would want to spend a day with all of us, please respect our privacy and know that, like any business would, we completely discourage any and all unlawful attempts to enter our relay. We love our tenno, but let's be respectful and law-abiding. Trespassing is never okay. In the aftermath of the statement, Undercover Legend deleted their account and went quiet on the matter, having failed completely to garner their desired reaction. They did not, however, face any litigation as a result of their actions. Two years after the incident took place, the aforementioned Project Keystone was officially announced as the Amazing Eternals. A closed beta was held in late August 2017 before it was cancelled months later due to lack of interest and to refocus resources into developing for Warframe. Ubisoft has something of a reputation for being less than airtight when it comes to leaks. The Assassin's Creed games are a good example of this, frequently being subject to breaches in confidentiality over the years. Honourable mentions to the time Assassin's Creed Black Flag was spotted by a Redditor on the laptop of a Ubisoft employee aboard a commercial aeroplane, when Assassin's Creed Origins was leaked via a t-shirt, or how the reveal of Assassin's Creed Odyssey was spoiled by a keyring. For this section though, I'll instead be focusing on a Ubisoft project that ended up being arguably one of the most leaked Nintendo Switch games ever, and it's one that I personally reported on as it happened, Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. This game stands out for the sheer breadth of material that was leaked in the run up to its reveal, everything from QA notes to internal marketing documents spilled out before it was even officially announced. Some of the earliest recorded whispers of the project that I was able to find date back to October 2016. French news site Gameblog.fr posted a series of rumours about Nintendo's next console, the Switch, which was codenamed NX at the time. Among the various topics touched upon, they briefly made mention of a Yoshi and Rabbids crossover game that was being discussed at Ubisoft. The first person to report on the rumours more thoroughly, however, was game journalist Laura K. Dale, who released a report on Let's Go Video Games about a Mario Rabbids crossover in development. 
Her sources said that it was a turn-based RPG with the working title Mario RPG Invasion of the Rabbids that was due to release alongside the Switch day one. They claimed it would feature the Mario universe being invaded by the rabbits, some friendly and some foe, and would feature a new Bowser form based around the design of the rabbits as a recurring boss. Several days later, I shared my thoughts on the story on a podcast. Um, Lord Kate seems to be more convinced that it will be um, like a, a conventional RPG. She said that one of the rumored names of it was was literally Mario RPG, and I'm not so sure about that. I've personally heard that it was more of like a tactical strategy RPG, similar to like XCOM or Fire Emblem. Over the course of the next two months, more and more information began leaking behind the scenes, and in January 2017, I took to Twitter to share some more of what I'd been hearing. I don't know what the title is. There was a Ruben name a little while back that had Mushroom Kingdom Battle in the title, I think. It's set in the Mushroom Kingdom, and the Rabbids dimension is sort of invading it. Most of the enemies are evil slash warped rabbits. It does feature Mario and various other main series characters. Nintendo has apparently been very controlling of how they are used. There are also rabbits themed around various Mario characters like Mario and Luigi, costumed rabbits, that sort of thing. For the following few months, Ubisoft sources continue to talk about the game in more and more detail. By April, I had a comprehensive understanding of the gameplay mechanics, story and structure. On May 1st, 2017, I released a new podcast discussing more about the project with my co-host Dan Thomas. There's like stats for each weapon, you know, lots of different weapons. There is a skill tree system that underpins the game, wow. uh, which sounds very Ubisoft. I wonder what the weapons are then. All I could think of is like a plunger for like the rabbits and that's like. Nah, no, I think it's like guns and stuff like that. I think like really like, like arm cannons and those kind of Nintendo -y weapons. E yeah. I mean, yeah. I I haven't really seen any of the weapons myself, but uh, my mm. someone I was speaking to was saying like there are a lot of weapons. They have a big. They, they're maintaining a massive spreadsheet with all of the different weapons on there, which sort of makes it sound a bit like Kid Icarus Uprising. It was just one day later that I received the first image I ever saw from the game, a low-quality off-screen picture of a logo spotted somewhere inside Ubisoft. It was so nondescript that even though the same source had provided a lot of other information, I wasn't sure it was even real. A part of me considered if this was an elaborate joke. However, that concern would be quickly dispensed with, as the leaks continued that month. Actual internal documents from Ubisoft began to be circulated behind the scenes, including key arts, prototype screenshots, and info from quality assurance tests. Among the leaked documents was a slideshow from an internal marketing presentation detailing everything from the characters and the structure of the game to the planned rollout, which ironically included the phrase, surprise at announcement. From my perspective, I thought that some of these documents appeared so sensitive that releasing them outright posed all kinds of complications. The closest thing I did to disclosing anything was that I took a Mario render from the project, crudely added some sunglasses to it, and made it my profile picture on Twitter in early May. Nobody noticed this until I pointed it out much later, with the exception of one person, media personality John Cartwright, who had access to the same image. I would estimate that dozens of people had access to this content, so it felt like it was only a matter of time before someone would release it. I had been quietly waiting for either that to happen, or for Ubisoft to announce the game themselves, when on May 23rd, 2017, what little secrecy remained was done away with. I was alerted to the fact that someone had been cropping pieces of the project's key art and posting it on a Discord server for video game news. Then people had been taking these images and sharing them on Twitter, including one containing the rabid Peach character. Although the original tweet was hastily deleted, it was quickly reposted by a user named Fatal Flowey. This was the first time the wider public got their eyes on material from the project. I reported on the story and posted the full key art that was being teased by others, confirming its authenticity in an article for WWG. Shortly thereafter, Nintendo World Report followed by releasing images of that internal Ubisoft slideshow presentation on the game. This included more arts, character information, and more. It was a massive outing of the game weeks before it was set to be revealed that dispelled any doubt that this unlikely project was real. 
Nearly three weeks later, on June 12th, 2017, it was finally announced officially at a Ubisoft E3 conference. Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto joined Ubisoft president Yves Guillemot for the reveal in front of the key art that had leaked weeks earlier. Despite some initial apprehension, it was broadly well received and the game went on to be very successful. But it's worth asking, why did the leaks happen? The answer is not as straightforward as some other cases. I was told that Ubisoft did carry out an internal investigation into the leaks, however there was no single cause or inciting incident, a lot was leaked and from many different people. I believe that it has something to do with the problematic workplace culture at Ubisoft, which myself and many others have heard a lot about over the years. In 2020, Ubisoft commissioned a study from an independent research firm to examine the state of the company following reports of rampant sexism, harassment, misconduct and other problems. A staggering 25% of their entire workforce who responded to this survey reported witnessing or experiencing misconduct first hand. Furthermore, one in five workers indicated that they didn't feel safe or respected in the work environment. In my experience, companies that don't respect their workforce are more prone to leaks. Workers who've had bad experiences or aren't happy with the direction their company is going in are less incentivized to keep their secrets. I do think that one big aspect at play as well is the sheer size of Ubisoft. With a game like Mario Rabbids, for example, hundreds of people worked on it across multiple branches around the world. The more people in on a secret like that, the harder it is to keep. Although, I do think there is something to be said for how disproportionately a company like Ubisoft has been impacted by leaks, given its extensive history of allegations and the poor reputation of its workplace culture. In 2003, Valve was deep into development on Half-Life 2, the sequel to its acclaimed 1998 first-person shooter. It had been in the works for several years at this point, with a release set for September of that year. An ambitious demo showcased at E3 2003 cemented it as one of the most anticipated games of the year. In reality though, it was far from finished, despite the team enduring extensive crunch throughout the summer of 2003. Valve was staring down the likelihood that the game would have to be delayed significantly, but at the same time they were being less than transparent with the press about its status. Valve reassured the media that it was set for September 30th, 2003 and kept telling them that as late as one week before that date. It wasn't until September 23rd that Valve finally came forward to confirm that the game was being delayed to late 2003, a sudden turnaround which upset a lot of fans. While Valve was fending off this public relations storm, another much more serious one was brewing on the horizon. On the night of October 1st, 2003, Valve discovered that an internal email sent between their employees had been posted online. It was found on the forums of a video game clan named MyGot, which was notorious for provoking people with hacking tools in multiplayer games like Counter-Strike. This leaked email tipped Valve off to the fact that their internal systems had been compromised. As time went on, the extent of that compromise became clear, as Valve's secrets were splashed across the internet. Passwords for internal Valve accounts were floating around, but this was quickly overshadowed by a much bigger discovery. Half-Life 2 source code had been leaked. Not only was this a massive breach of their security, the leak laid bare how unfinished Half-Life 2 truly was, a fact Valve could now no longer hide. The source code was posted by an individual calling himself Osama Bin Lika, who pulled no punches in his assessment of the situation, claiming Valve had faked its much-hyped E3 demo earlier in the year. In the immediate aftermath, the company faced a torrent of abuse and criticism from fans, who now accused them of deception. Hours after the leaks began, Valve CEO Gabe Newell sprang into action. He first contacted the FBI, telling them that he believed his studio had been hacked and that many millions of dollars worth of code had been stolen. Then he posted to the official Half-Life 2 forums, where he confirmed for the first time that the leaks were real and asked the community for their help in unmasking those responsible. Quote, Ever have one of those weeks? This has just not been the best couple of days for me or for Valve. Yes, the source code that has been posted is the HL2 source code. An extensive investigation into the incident was launched at Valve in cooperation with the FBI. Forensic analysis revealed that 13 different computers had been compromised with keyloggers and Trojan horses. 
Despite the many theories that emerged about the culprits, as the months went by, investigators failed to come up with anything concrete. The only solid lead had been turned up not by federal agents, but by a member of the Half-Life community who emailed Valve, claiming to know who was behind the attack. They submitted chat logs in which a user called Ago shared sensitive security information from inside Valve, such as Gabe Newell's personal username and password, although this was not investigated further at the time. Meanwhile, the leaks had wreaked an untold amount of financial damage upon the company. According to FBI documents from the time, the unfinished game had been burned to CDs and sold throughout countries like Russia. Given this and the game being readily available for people to download, Valve told the FBI that they estimated as much as a quarter of a billion dollars had been lost in sales. This figure was an exaggeration. It assumed that nobody with the leaked version would buy their eventual finished product, but it gives you an idea idea of the value Valve was placing on their intellectual property. There was one silver lining for them in the affair, and that was being able to blame the hackings for Half-Life 2 being late. On the 7th of October 2003, Vivendi confirmed to the press that the game would be delayed until 2004, and pointed to the leak as the sole reason why. The hacks did cause all manner of hardships at the company. Money was lost, morale plummeted, and it was an unwelcome distraction that pulled staff away from making the game. In a way though, it also shielded Valve from criticism that the project was taking too long, and that they hadn't been forthcoming about their progress. As time went on, the team continued work on the game, and Gabe Newell did his best to reassure them, reportedly saying in one meeting, we've made it through all this, how much worse can it get? The leaks had stopped for the time being, but Gabe's brush with the culprit was far from over. The FBI investigation into the events had made little progress when on the 15th of February 2004, Newell received an email from the hacker himself. It had been sent from an encrypted email address, dagai at hush.com used to maintain his anonymity. In the message, Dagai claimed responsibility for hacking Valve, but said he was not the person who leaked the game. The man behind the Dagai persona was Axel Gembe, a 21-year-old Valve enthusiast from Germany who went by the online alias Ago, the same person that some in the community had been raising alarm bells about months earlier. He had acted alone in his intrusion into their network and had been quietly snooping around inside it for six months prior to the leaks. In around April of 2003, Axel had grown tired of the wait for Half-Life 2 and decided that he would try to learn more about the project on his own terms. He was a proficient hacker and programmer who had in the past authored and sold his own malware, such as Agobot, a family of computer worms. Genbei found his entry point into Valve through another business being run out of the same building called Tangus, a wearable technology company which was operated by Dan Newell, a relative of Gabe Newell. Axel hacked into an unsecured account on the official Tangus website and then used software he had written to exploit its server, tricking it into raising the privileges on his account. He found that the firewalls and Valve servers had a trust relationship with Tangus that meant someone with access to Tangus could interact with Valve's internal network. He used this knowledge to scan Valve's network until he found an account on it with no password. He entered this account and then used a cracking tool to extract usernames and passwords from Valve's network. From there, he was eventually able to locate the server with Half-Life 2's data on it and monitor the project's progress. He installed a rootkit on Valve's server, enabling him to mask his presence, which it successfully did for around half a year. He went on to extract code, assets, and other data to observe, but he apparently declined to leak any of it. According to Axel Gembe, his motivations were not outwardly malicious. He was simply a passionate Half-Life fan with an insatiable curiosity about the new game. Months later, however, he slipped up. After keeping his access to Valve's network secret for several months, he shared the news with a friend over an internet relay chat in September 2003. Gembe supposedly thought that his conversation was being held in confidence, but days later someone used the information he divulged in this chat to break into Valve's network themselves. Gembe believed that the owners of the IRC, which had some association with the My God Trolling Clan, were responsible. Either they eavesdropped on his conversation, or the person he sent this information to shared it with them later against his wishes. 
On September 19, 2003, someone stole the source code for Half-Life 2 and infected Valve's computers with malware and keystroke loggers. Less than two weeks later, the stolen material surfaced online. Gembe then reached out to Valve's head in February 2004, where he anonymously confessed to infiltrating his company and passed on who he believed had perpetrated the leak. He provided details of the hack to prove his legitimacy and apologized for the outcome of his actions. Quote, Hello Gabe, I'm very sorry about what happened with HL2. I wanted to help you people get to know the truth by writing this mail, and I never intended to harm you. I only didn't tell you I was in your network because I was afraid to get kicked out. I just wanted to observe the Half-Life 2 development process because I'm a hobby developer myself and a big fan of Half-Life 2. Let's just say I'm amazed by the capabilities of your team. After some initial disbelief on Gabe Newell's part, Gembe eventually convinced Valve's president that he was the person responsible for the hacking, and over the following weeks the two shared a fairly amicable exchange on the surface of it. By the 19th of February 2004, Gembe became comfortable enough talking with Newell that he floated the idea of being given a job at Valve. Initially, Newell believed this could have been a joke before Gembe clarified that he was entirely serious. He went on to explain that he wanted to leave his country out of concern he would be conscripted into the military. Military service was compulsory in Germany at the time for ages 18 to 27. Newell, who was working with the FBI to catch Axel Gembe, entertained his request. Quote, You certainly impressed us with your skills. We've hired a lot of people from the community, and I guess in a funny way this would be more of the same. The two continued talking, intending to set up a job interview towards the end of February 2004. Newell's responses became less frequent as he was busy negotiating Valve's plans for E3 with Microsoft. Early into March 2004, Gembe expressed his impatience with the pace of Newell's correspondence. Newell apologised, saying, I'll try to be more prompt in my replies. Days later, however, Newell's replies were still not coming fast enough for Gembe's liking, and he responded with a veiled threat. May I ask what your definition of prompt is? If my intents weren't to clear this thing up, I could have already taken over your FTP server. Over the following weeks, Gembe advised Valve on other potential vulnerabilities in their security, and the two finally set up a job interview. It wasn't real, of course. Valve and the FBI aimed to solicit identifying information from Gembe and possibly even lure him to the United States for prosecution. The interview was conducted over the phone by Valve developers Greg Coomer and Matt Bamberger. After Greg Coomer commented how unusual it was to hold an interview without knowing the name of the interviewee, Gembe shed his Dagai persona for the first time, volunteering his full name and country of origin. Over the course of the conversation, he disclosed in-depth technical details on how he encroached into Valve's network. Eventually, the employees thanked him and proposed that he should fly to the US for an in-person interview with all expenses covered by Valve. The investigators on the case used the information they obtained from this call, such as his phone number, to locate Gembe's home in Germany and alerted the German authorities. While Gembe prepared for his trip to the US, the Germans spent a few weeks obtaining an arrest warrant. Early in the morning of May 7, 2004, Axel Gembe awoke to find himself surrounded by German police officers pointing automatic weapons at his head. He was told to get up, get dressed, and come with them down to the local police station. There, he was interrogated for three hours about the incident, although the police were apparently more concerned with investigating Sasa, a computer worm written by another German hacker who authorities mistakenly believed Gembe could have been colluding with. He refuted this and other claims, apparently telling them, quote, I never write such shoddy code. He was held in custody for the following two weeks before being released pending trial and had to check in with the police three times a week until then. In November 2006, his day in court finally arrived. The trial concluded that while he had hacked Valve, there was no evidence to suggest he was the one responsible for disseminating Half-Life 2. He was therefore given a two-year suspended sentence and spared jail time. The judge took into account Gembe's difficult childhood, including that he had been abandoned by his mother and the steps he had taken to improve his life since his arrest. He had completed an apprenticeship and in September 2004 gained employment as a programmer. German police told him that had Valve succeeded in luring him to the US, he likely would have faced a far more severe sentence. 
Half-Life 2 was released to rave reviews and huge commercial success in November 2004. The leaked build was taken from over a year before it was finished. In the years since, Axel Gembe has expressed his regret over the affair and apologised to Valve publicly. In 2014, he spoke with Eurogamer, where he addressed Gabe Newell personally. Quote, I am so very sorry for what I did to you. I never intended to cause you harm. If I couldn't do it, I would. It still makes me sad thinking about it. I would have loved to just stay and watch you do your thing, but in the end, I screwed it up. You are my favourite developer, and I will always buy your games. Genbei's story has since become regarded as one of the most infamous leaks in video game history, and he has remained a divisive figure among the Half-Life fanbase. Some hail him as a hero for his role in releasing in-development content, others still criticise him for hindering Half-Life 2's creation. Either way, he would be far from the last person involved in hacking, whose actions would result in a high-profile video game leak. In the past, I have extensively chronicled the troubled development of Dead Rising 4. One facet of its history that we've yet to explore, however, is how the game leaked online weeks before it was announced. The inside story of the Dead Rising 4 leaks has never before been told, but it's one that snowballs into federal law enforcement getting involved. The person responsible for disclosing material of the game early was a man from the United States known in enthusiast circles for obtaining and releasing video game prototypes. This individual, who goes by the online handle Pixelbuts, gained some notoriety in January 2016 for dumping an in-development prototype of the cancelled Star Wars Battlefront 3 game by Free Radical. I spoke to the man in question years later to learn more about what happened. Pixelbuts was a prominent member of Assembler Games, a forum that was commonly used to trade prototypes and share information on unreleased games. He had developed a reputation there both for his releases and for providing mirrors to various prototypes dumped by others. While it's true that the act of uploading these prototypes could be deemed copyright infringement, it's rare for companies to actually pursue individuals for doing so, especially when they're from a defunct studio like Free Radical. After unleashing the Battlefront prototype onto the web in early 2016, Pixel initially feared incurring a legal response from the Star Wars rights holders Disney, but nothing ever came of it. The lack of consequences for this release, he told me, emboldened him to leak more. Months later, in May 2016, Pixel was contacted by a user on Assembler Games who offered to send him a selection of prototypes to back up. Among these were pre-release builds of games like 2013's Tomb Raider, Mighty No. 9, Thief 4, and the cancelled sequel to Blur by Bizarre Creations. There was also a prototype of a game that wasn't even publicly known to exist at the time, Dead Rising 4. The project was actively in development at Capcom's Vancouver studio and had yet to be announced. Pixel saved what he was able to of the data passed on to him before turning his attention to what was an in-development PC build of the New Dead Rising sequel. It took two whole days for the prototype to finish downloading, but he eventually opened it up, just barely able to run it on his low-spec computer. Before people outside of Microsoft and Capcom had even learned of its existence, Pixel was playing through Dead Rising 4 in the comfort of his own home. Had he decided to stay quiet about his discovery, it's unlikely that he would have faced any repercussions for accessing the game early, but he instead chose to share it with the world. Taking the 4chan's V-board, Pixel started by sharing screenshots of Mighty No. 9 throughout May 2016, while the game was still a month out from launch. Then he began dropping hints that he had access to the next Dead Rising game, to the confusion of some posters. On the 6th of June 2016, he finally decided to back up his claims by releasing pictures of Dead Rising 4 on 4chan, which had been taken off screen using his phone. Over the following hours, Pixel shared his thoughts on the prototype and continued uploading more images, including direct in-game screenshots. The game was officially announced during Microsoft's 2016 E3 press conference on June 12th, but that didn't deter Pixel from disclosing even more images and information in the days that followed. He even hosted his own Q&A, fielding questions about its gameplay, story and more. A few weeks passed and Pixelbuts believed he'd gotten off scot-free for the leaks, until he received a cease and desist notice from Capcom threatening legal action if he continued. The letter finally put a stop to his posts, although much bigger problems were in store for the leaker. Later that month on July 28, 2016, the US Department of Justice showed up at his house with a search warrant. 
Officers entered and seized the computers he had used to run the unreleased games. Pixel read through the details of the warrant, and it was then that he realised the extent of his troubles and why the government had tracked him down. It was all related to the origins of the prototypes he had received back in May from a user on Assembler Games. As it turned out, the prototype builds he was sent were the outcome of an international hacking scandal. Months before first making contact with Pixel, the user had remotely hacked into the Polish branch of a quality assurance company named Testronic Labs. Companies like these are commonly employed by larger developers to outsource QA work. The individual had allegedly exploited a vulnerability in a security camera at Testronic, using this to gain access to their network and stealing a full terabyte of data. This included files from countless unreleased projects like Dead Rising 4. Pixel believed that he was sent only a fraction of the total amount stolen from Testronic, but his connection to the affair now had him facing a felony. Had he kept his head down like others who handled the data, he could have avoided charges because it was actually the distribution of the stolen material on 4chan, particularly relating to Dead Rising 4, that brought law enforcement to his door. He was charged with stealing trade secrets and for knowingly accepting stolen property. The latter charge was eventually dropped when it became clear he hadn't known the data was stolen. Despite having his computer seized, he continued to update 4chan intermittently on his turbulent situation. In August 2016, he posted, Waiting to get my computers back. Sucks man, don't fuck up. Pixel was ultimately subject to 200 hours of community service, 3 years of formal probation, and $20,000 bail, which was lowered to $1,700 with bail bonds. The experience, he told me, left him regretful for his actions and reconsidering how he would handle prototypes in the future. Quote, My record was later lowered to a misdemeanor and expunged, but in my mind, I still couldn't shake what happened. A pretty big wake-up call for me. I wasn't invincible. I definitely did it to myself and earned it, so I own my mistake and it ended up making my sentencing less severe in the end, even though it guaranteed I got some punishment. Years later, Pixelbutts remains the only person to have faced criminal charges as a result of the incident. Even the original hacker has evaded law enforcement. Despite this, Pixel was able to have his record expunged and eventually found a job working in the games industry, doing quality assurance no less. His story is a reminder of how seriously larger companies can take leaks and the dangers of handling material of dubious origin. To say that there was hype around The Last of Us Part 2 in the run-up to launch would be putting it lightly. Here was the sequel to one of the most critically lauded games of its generation, with over five years in development, and aside from a few tantalising trailers, details about the direction the story would take were still tightly under wraps. The game was initially set to launch on May 29th, 2020, but was delayed indefinitely on the 2nd of April that year. While it was on the verge of being finished, the events of 2020 posed significant logistical issues that made shipping it on its original schedule no longer possible. However, it was just one day later that developer Naughty Dog's carefully curated bubble of secrecy began to show cracks. A series of short prototype gameplay clips surfaced on YouTube, which showed some more of the game. Among these were shots of the protagonist Ellie riding a horse and a guitar mini game. Sony acted quickly, copyright striking the videos within about 10 minutes of them being uploaded. Rumours about the game's narrative would make the rounds on Reddit in the following days, but it was on the 26th of April 2020 that the dam well and truly broke. Well over an hour of cutscenes and gameplay videos from The Last of Us Part 2 flooded onto YouTube via anonymous sources, showing sections of the game that had never before been seen. I will not be discussing any spoilers for the game's plot in this video, but it's safe to say that major parts of it were revealed against the developer's wishes in these momentous leaks. Huge revelations about the story's direction and the fate of its characters were spoiled months before the game's launch. All of the videos were very clearly taken from in-development prototypes of the game, as evidenced by details like the build dates being visible during the footage. Some of the material dated back months prior to the videos surfacing, suggesting whoever was responsible for obtaining them could have been at it for a while. The content of the footage, especially with regards to cutscenes, proved extremely divisive, despite some select moments being shown out of context. 
Many fans were upset by the overwhelming abundance of spoilers online and pleaded with Naughty Dog to expedite the game's launch by releasing it digitally, but the suggestion went unrealized. Sony stuck firm to its new planned launch date of June 19th, 2020. Naughty Dog acknowledged the situation for the first time on April 27th in a statement posted to Twitter. Quote, we know the last few days have been incredibly difficult for you. We feel the same. It's disappointing to see the release and sharing of pre-release footage from development. Do your best to avoid spoilers and we ask that you don't spoil it for others. The Last of Us Part 2 will be in your hands soon. No matter what you see and hear, the final experience will be worth it. Neil Druckmann, one of the game's co-directors, later discussed his perspective on the leaks during an interview of Kinda Funny Games. It was one of the worst days of my life uh, <laughs> when, when that leak happened, because it's like I saw it happening in real time. Like I saw when it hit YouTube and we're just all panicking, texting each other for them to take it down. It, you know, there's a lag, so it takes like an hour to take it down. Sure. And it had like hundreds, maybe a thousand views before it got all taken down. And then you just sit there and you're like, your fucking heart sinks and you're like, it's out there. It's only a matter of time before it blows up and you're just waiting and it's like, a few hours later, it's everywhere. And you're starting to get hate on every social media you're on. And soon that turns into death threats and anti-Semitic remarks and like just craziness I could have never anticipated. In the hours after the videos leaked, an onslaught of dubious theories and rumors emerged as to their source. The most prominent of these alleged that a vengeful Naughty Dog contractor had sought retribution against the company following a pay dispute. One of the first people responsible for pushing this narrative was Super Metal Dave 64, a YouTuber and purveyor of video game rumors. Many who believe this theory cited a March 2020 Kotaku expose on Naughty Dog's working conditions as evidence for it. The author of the piece, Jason Schreier, had spoken to developers who detailed an unrelenting culture of crunch at the studio. Soon, this idea that a disgruntled worker was behind the leaks gained traction across message boards and social media. One post that took off on Reddit, for instance, alleged the leaker had sought revenge after Naughty Dog had refused to pay out bonuses. Another source behind the rumors was an article published hours after the leaks took place by a politically far-right culture blog from Australia named Sausage Roll. In the weeks prior, false rumors about the plot of The Last of Us Part II were shared by Sausage Roll, claiming that the game featured anti-Christian rhetoric. Sausage Roll lifted a fabricated plot synopsis posted to 4chan, which alleged the story was about an anti-gay religious cult hunting down a same-sex couple. Extrapolating from this wholly invented 4chan post, Sausage Roll claimed that the leaks were perpetrated by a Christian Naughty Dog worker who didn't approve of the game's LGBT characters. The article's writer, Arena Rose, who lambasted the plot as politically divisive, even included quotes from a fake Naughty Dog source to add credence to their claims. Sausage Roll's story was then reported on by a number of enthusiast game blogs who took it at face value, but it was nothing more than an attempt at astroturfing to direct negativity towards the game's same-sex romance. For nearly a week, multiple variations of the disgruntled worker rumors persisted until May 3rd, 2020, when none other than Pixelbutts, the aforementioned person behind the Dead Rising 4 leaks, came forward with new information. He had gathered evidence that it was not the work of a Naughty Dog employee, but hackers. I followed up with Pixelbutts to learn more about what happened. Through his connections, Pixel uncovered that a group of Naughty Dog fans had exploited a hole in the company's security. In January 2020, this group discovered that each of Naughty Dog's games with online functionality had their own corresponding cloud storage server via Amazon Web Services. When the studio issued the final patch for each of these titles, the security credentials to gain access to these servers were added into the data for these games. Investigating deeper, the hackers found that the Amazon service for each game contained some amount of data from their sequel. For example, Uncharted's contained data from Uncharted 2, Uncharted 2's had some from Uncharted 3, and so on. This was due to the project's sharing technology and assets. The group used this knowledge to access the server corresponding to the PS4 remastered version of the original Last of Us, and it was there that they found the material from The Last of Us Part 2. 
Around a terabyte of data was allegedly extracted in total from across their various projects. Pixel believes that the group of hackers who made these discoveries had no intention of publicly leaking any material from upcoming games and were merely enthusiasts curious about the inner workings of Naughty Dog. However, one of them eventually decided to share some of the content with another member of the public outside of their inner circle, and it was this individual who was apparently responsible for leaking it. Pixel later supplied Naughty Dog with details of the breach and understands that the vulnerability has since been fixed. On the subject of the initial rumours, he had this to say. When this happened, it was the perfect storm given the story of the game and the way things were playing out at the time. High turnover of employees, incredibly hard crunch, etc. It was the perfect lie for some free internet points. On the same day as Pixel's initial Twitter posts, game journalist Jason Schreier came forward to back up his account of events. Speaking to GameIndustry.biz in May 2020, Sony revealed that they had identified the primary individuals responsible for the leaks and confirmed that they had no affiliation with either Naughty Dog or Sony. According to Pixel, the group responsible for the exploit was investigated by authorities and did have a series of PlayStation 4 dev kits seized and returned to Sony, but faced no other legal consequences. I spoke to sources linked to Sony and Naughty Dog, who indicated the same was true for the leaker themselves. The Last of Us Part 2 leaks caused not only considerable difficulties for those at the companies affected, they created a schism between players who were divided over their content and set the stage for untold levels of misinformation. They go down in history as some of the generation's biggest and most shocking outings of confidential info. Between 2018 and 2021, the video game community was blindsided by a series of leaks so large that the very act of fully understanding their contents proved challenging for preservationists. The Nintendo Giga Leak is what many have called the biggest video game leak of all time. It was a succession of huge data dumps containing files lifted directly from inside Nintendo, some of which dated all the way back to the early 1990s. It revealed many previously unseen game prototypes, early unused material from various projects, rejected pitches, hardware prototypes, and even the source code from some of Nintendo's biggest games. The historical significance of it all is hard to overstate. While cataloguing every piece of the gig leak is no doubt a worthwhile endeavour, I want to focus for now on how it happened in the first place, who was responsible, and the implications of it. Over the years, a consensus has formed that a single person was responsible for extracting this data from Nintendo originally. Zatmus Clark was a self-taught cybersecurity expert who fell into an underground world of hacking in the mid-2010s. Clark adopted a variety of different online aliases at the height of his hacktivist infamy, such as Slipstream, Wacko, Rayleigh, and Riley. He first gained some notoriety after exploiting security flaws in VTech, a camera-based gadget for children. He demonstrated that an SQL injection could be used to effortlessly expose the names and addresses of its young user base. Clark's initial hacking efforts were fairly conscientious, as he helped to highlight the shoddy security practices of large companies like this, though as time went on, such moral concerns became less of a priority for him. On January 24th, 2017, he hacked into servers used by Microsoft to host in-development versions of the Windows operating system. Clark then shared his methodology with a group of hackers over an internet relay chat, allowing others to follow suit and steal the confidential information of users. He also uploaded malware to the network before being discovered and arrested on June 22nd, 2017, along with one co-conspirator. Zamis Clark was released on bail pending trial, but rather than keep his head down in the subsequent months, he decided to do the exact opposite and attempt an even bigger and more risky intrusion. Nine months after his arrest in March 2018, Clark breached a number of servers belonging to Nintendo, which hosted a wealth of data relating to their intellectual property. Clark's access to Nintendo's servers went undetected for months, during which time he extracted many gigabytes worth of sensitive files, including source code and raw assets from game projects. 
During my research, I was able to find evidence that some of this material was shared with other parties by Zamis following the hack, which undoubtedly resulted in it later being leaked to the public. Zamis Clark's invasion into Nintendo was detected by them in May 2018, just as he started to leak a slither of what he had taken. Towards the end of April, he leaked the software development kit for the iQ player. This was a device created for the Chinese market that circumvented their government's ban on home consoles. It was worked on in collaboration with Nintendo and could play a selection of Nintendo 64 games. This leak enabled a group of enthusiasts to hack into the iQ player and preserve its library of games, a feat that had never before been accomplished. One month later, Clark's leaking continued. Assuming a blank username on Discord, he shared early demos of Pokemon Gold and Silver for the Game Boy Color, which were previously only shown at the 1997 Nintendo Space World event. Once considered a white whale of video game history for many fans, Zamas released it to a small Discord server of Pokemon modders on May 26th, 2018. They went on to study its many differences, such as early alternate sprites, before circulating it more widely. Following an investigation by UK authorities, Zamis Clark was re-arrested in March 2019. He later pleaded guilty to hacking both Microsoft and Nintendo, the latter of which estimated he had cost them upwards of £1.4 million in damages. The 24-year-old was given a 15-month prison sentence, which was suspended for 18 months. The judge decided to spare him prison time due to his autism and facial blindness, which was concluded would put him at risk of facing violence from fellow inmates and ultimately re-offending. It was during his suspended sentence, however, that the ripple effects of his actions would be most strongly felt. Recipients of the material stolen from Nintendo by Zamis gradually began to release it in batches through download links on 4chan. The most infamous of these disclosures took place in late July 2020. Within this drop was the source code for some of Nintendo's most well-known titles, including Yoshi's Island, Super Mario Kart, Super Mario World, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and many others. The leaks enabled a rare and intimate look behind the curtain of Nintendo, and how some of their most famous games evolved over the course of development. There were early alternate designs for characters like Yoshi from Super Mario World, assets from the earliest prototypes for Zelda Ocarina of Time, even some long-awaited visual evidence that Luigi was once intended to be playable in Super Mario 64. This was something that fans had speculated about for decades, and finally they got a glimpse of what it would have looked like. Fragments of a Luigi model were found among the leaked content for Mario 64, and enthusiasts were able to piece it together. Nintendo designer Shigeru Miyamoto has commented on Luigi's planned appearance in the past, explaining his removal. Nintendo tested out a multiplayer mode in Mario 64 during development, where Mario and Luigi could both run around the same world together, and the camera would zoom out if the two characters moved further apart. He told Wired.com in 2009 that this experiment was abandoned due to the technical constraints of the N64 hardware. Star Fox was another franchise that featured heavily in the leaks. The source code for Star Fox 2 on the Super Nintendo was found, revealing to the world previously unseen characters that didn't make it into the final game, including a T-Rex villain and a female human pilot. Star Fox 64's code was among the data as well, enabling fans to mine uncompressed audio files from the game for the first time. We need your help, Star Fox! Falco here. I'm fine. This is Peppy. All systems go. Slippy here. I'm okay. I see him up ahead. Let's rock and roll! Full quality image files from this era were in great abundance too. Fans uncovered higher res versions of art assets from titles like Ocarina of Time that had never before been made available. One major discovery from the Giga Leak was Super Donkey, an early internal Nintendo prototype for the SNES that predated the development of Yoshi's Island. In this 2D platformer, the player controlled a limbless man wearing an aviator hat who could fly throughout levels. The player could navigate between the foreground and background by entering doors. Meanwhile, preservationists unearthed the full development repository of an unreleased Game Boy Advance add-on known as the iQ Netcard. This highly ambitious device was planned for the Chinese market and was set to allow users to watch movies, download full games, and play games online. Extensive documentation from the project was found in the data by Luigi Blood that outlined plans for online play in games like F-Zero Maximum Velocity. 
An online game based around Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green was once in the works for it as well, which would have included PC connectivity and an online tournament mode. As the months went by, more huge data leaks stemming from Zamus Clark's breach would continue to surface, such as one in September 2020. This round included a multitude of prototypes for the Game Boy, including an unreleased Hello Kitty Game Boy camera game. There were also development materials from some later titles like Wii Sports. The project was revealed to have had a Pilot Wings-esque jetpack game tested for it at one point. In October 2020, more data surfaced related to the Pokemon games on the Nintendo Switch. For instance, prototypes of Pokemon Sword and Shield were leaked, revealing a number of early unused assets like an alternate tile screen and an abandoned design for a female version of the Rotom Pokédex. The leaks continued into 2021, with a last major bout taking place in July of that year. This batch included a wealth of information from the mid-2000s concerning the GameCube and Wii. A slew of confidential documents were contained within that people such as Mondomega provided translations for. One spreadsheet from 2005 featured an extensive list of planned titles for the Wii, DS and GameCube, some of which were never released or even announced. A sequel to Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix on the GameCube was planned to be made for the Wii at Konami. A Metroid game was once in development at Intelligent Systems that was set to release after Metroid Prime 3. Fuse Games, the creators of Metroid Prime Pinball, were working on a Pokemon pinball game also for the DS, which was slated for September 2006. A medieval-themed Battalion Wars spin-off named Night Wars was in the works at Kuju London. All of these never saw the light of day. Other documents showed a number of early internal prototypes made to test the capabilities of the Wii. These included Koopa Trooper Forest, a top-down shooter where Mario moved through a forest environment, and Mario FPS, a shooting game using the Wii Remote's infrared pointer that was set in Delfino Plaza from Super Mario Sunshine. There were images of prototypes for the Wii's user interface, including an unfinished Wii Shop channel from August 2006, and a long list of rejected codenames for the Wii. Nintendo had considered options such as New Nintendo GameCube, Nintendo Aqua, Famicom Beyond, Nintendo Lethal Weapon, Nintendo Party Room, Nintendo Everlasting Wave, and even Nintendo Final Attack. They eventually settled on Nintendo Revolution. More unreleased IQ projects were found in this portion of the breach, such as plans for an IQ GameCube console. This would have played not only GameCube games, but CDs and DVDs as well. Its developers had even outlined some form of karaoke capability for it. It would not have been compatible with regular GameCube discs, instead using GameCube games released on standard sized DVDs exclusively in China. None of these plans ultimately came to fruition. The legacy of the GigaLeak, or GigaLeaks depending on how you distinguish them, is complicated. To game historians, it represented a treasure trove of new information that redefined our understanding of how some of Nintendo's most culturally significant titles came to be, but its contents were stolen and published against the will of those involved in its creation. Alongside all of the prototypes and art that titillated fans was a lot of data that was never intended for public consumption under any circumstances. Private messages sent between employees, including some from Argonaut Games, surfaced in the leaks, and some of the people affected by this weren't pleased. Star Fox developer Dylan Cuthbert offered his perspective on the source code leaks over Twitter, saying, quote, It's private stuff, so it feels intrusive. Source code is hours and hours, years and years of personal work, long hours, sweat and tears. In the grand totality of the Giga Leak, there was some collateral damage. Not just the potential financial damage of Nintendo's source code leaking, but some developers were embarrassed to have their private exchanges aired publicly around 30 years after they were written. On the other hand, there was a wealth of perfectly legitimate information on Nintendo's history that would have never been made available otherwise. There was value in this not just for game enthusiasts, but also for developers who had worked with Nintendo over the years. In 2020, I was researching a cancelled Game Boy peripheral called the Workboy. This was a keyboard-based add-on with a productivity software suite produced by a company named Fabtech in collaboration with Nintendo. 
In the summer of that year, I was able to recover the only known prototype of the keyboard hardware confirmed to still exist. It was the first time one had been found since it was cancelled back in 1992. Mere weeks after obtaining the prototype, the September 2020 leak took place and the Workboy software was found within it. I was able to pair the software with the hardware and get it working for the first time in decades. Another positive to come out of this experience, however, was getting to reunite the developers of the Workboy with their software, which none of them had archived. The creator of the Workboy, Eddie Gill, for example, had no copy of his work from all those years ago and was delighted to be able to have a ROM of it to hold on to. All this to say that the gig leak was far from a black and white situation ethically. Zamis Clark's illegal activities came to an end following his second arrest and he abandoned the accounts where he once documented his exploits. He has since continued his research into cybersecurity and gave a talk on it at the Electromagnetic Field Festival in June 2022. We next direct our attention to the story behind the underground world of Xbox 360 hacking and how it eventually culminated in one of the most infamous and inexplicable video game leaks of all time. Back in its heyday, the Xbox 360 enjoyed a fairly open development environment due to a service called PartnerNet. This was essentially a private Xbox Live service accessible via development hardware that allowed developers to download work-in-progress builds of upcoming games. Studios would upload prototypes of their games, often for testers to examine Xbox Live specific features, but they would also be available to anyone with a development kit connected to PartnerNet, including people from other companies. Developers had to sign non-disclosure agreements with Microsoft to prevent them from revealing any confidential material to the public. In comparison to the highly secretive nature of modern game development, this was a radically open system that lended well both to creative collaboration and inevitably exploitation. If members of the public were somehow able to access these development units and connect them to PartnerNet, it was only a matter of time before leaks would occur, and as time went on, that was precisely what happened. But how did these machines escape the watchful eye of Microsoft? There were a couple of different major causes. These development kits were property of Microsoft and intended to be sent back to them once they were no longer needed or if they became defective. Given that these kits were based on the Xbox 360, which had an unusually high rate of hardware failure, this was a fairly common occurrence. Non-functional devices would be shipped back to Microsoft, who would dispatch them to electronic recycling centers for them to be destroyed. Sometimes workers at these facilities would retain components from devices like Xboxes to resell them. In 2006, an enthusiast Xbox modder named Rowdy Van Cleve learned that his local recycling plant was filled with parts like these and took to investigating. He discovered that the center was rife with disused Xbox development hardware, including motherboards from dev kits, not just a handful, but thousands of them. Van Cleve struck a deal with this recycling center to purchase the hardware and began distributing them to his friends in the Xbox hacking scene. The group, which later became referred to as Xbox Underground, found that they were able to resurrect these kits by swapping in new parts from retail Xbox 360 units. From there, they eventually began being sold online as more people joined their community and others around the world began finding these parts at their local recycling facilities. Another big avenue through which development hardware made it into the wild was theft. The late 2000s through to the early 2010s saw many studio closures, due at least partly to the global financial crisis. This meant a lot of people abruptly lost their jobs, sometimes without severance pay, so it wasn't uncommon for workers to take items from the offices without permission in their last days, such as prototypes and dev kits. Sometimes these would be lifted for sentimental value, a way for them to hold onto a piece of a console project that they had spent a lot of hours toiling away on, but some developers would also try to reclaim a piece of their financial stability by selling them. It therefore became common for dev kits to appear on auction sites, enthusiast trading forums, even in second-hand stores and yard sales from time to time. As the years went on, Microsoft failed to keep track of many thousands of units like these, and it led to some of the biggest leaks in video game history.
On the 4th of February 2010, after months of teasing, Sega unveiled to the world Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1. They dropped a trailer with a few seconds of gameplay and a release window of summer 2010. Decades on from Sonic 3 & Knuckles, the original 2D Sonic saga was finally being continued. Fans were divided over its new visual style, but there was plenty of excitement around its potential. Then, less than two weeks later, the floodgates opened. Over the course of a couple of days, footage of every single level in the game leaked. Sega's plans of carefully drip-feeding single images of concept art were suddenly upended. Soon, there was a direct feed playthrough of the entire game floating around online before Sega had been able to show hardly anything from it on their own terms. For context, this was the extent of the gameplay they had shown prior to this happening. That was it. They went from showing about three seconds worth to the whole game being out there to view. And worse yet, they received some brutal feedback from fans on it. Regardless of this being a work in progress build months away from launch, the Sonic community laid into it, criticizing its presentation, the platforming physics, and the inclusion of two unique stages in particular. Casino Street Zone Act 2 was originally a pinball level where the player had to rack up 100,000 points to complete it. More egregiously from the perspective of a lot of fans, however, was Lost Labyrinth Zone's Act 2. In this stage, the player was required to tilt a minecart by rotating the level to deliver Sonic to the end goal. Not only did these levels stray away from the traditional 2D platforming many people were expecting, but the mechanics of the minecart especially were criticised for appearing cumbersome and gimmicky. The debacle was a disaster for Sega, who very quickly lost control of the narrative and it irreversibly damaged the reputation of the project. People were soon able to pinpoint the source of the leaks, and yes, it was PartnerNet. Members of the public had used it to access a pre-release build of Sonic 4 Episode 1 and leaked its contents without repercussions. Sega hastily tried to control the spread of leaked videos, copyright striking people uploading them to YouTube, but even that was a losing battle as the videos were easily found on other hosting sites. For the following three months, Sega went radio silent, until the 20th of May when they announced that they were delaying the game to late 2010 in response to fan feedback. It was an almost unprecedented decision. Rather than pretend the leaks hadn't happened, Sega chose to listen to the feedback directed at these unofficial videos of prototype footage and attempt to implement what they could with the remaining time and budget they had left. One of the biggest shakeups was that those two gimmick-based acts were stripped out of the console versions of the game entirely and redone from the ground up as traditional 2D stages. They only appeared in the mobile versions of the game, where they remained largely unchanged. In response to the leaks, Microsoft briefly took PartnerNet offline in February 2010 and began remotely bricking some of the consoles it suspected of accessing the service without proper authorization. Ultimately, however, they couldn't stop arguably the most notorious PartnerNet leak from occurring two years later. It's late May 2012, and the Halo fandom is reeling from a series of possible leaks. A user named R Video posts to the Halo forum about a message he received from a friend of his who is claiming to have played Halo 4. The game isn't set to be released until the end of the year. There is no public beta. There has hardly been any footage of the game released yet, but somehow this person, this friend of R Video's, claims to have played it. Our video's friend goes on to tell him all about the game, as well as the circumstances through which they apparently accessed it. They claim that they were invited over to a friend's house. This person, who we'll call Person X, tells him that he's in a private Halo 4 beta. Come over and check it out. Our video's friend is skeptical. He searches Google for word of a Halo 4 beta and can't find any information on one. But then he remembers that the father of Person X works for Microsoft, so his doubts are assuaged. He takes a leap of faith and heads over there, only to find that, as promised, he really does have the Halo 4 demo before seemingly anyone else in the world. He isn't told how this is possible, but doesn't pry, and assumes that his dad's connections made this happen. 
Our video's friend enjoys the game, they message our video about it, describing some of the new features, before finally adding that the icon for the game app on the Xbox was simply labelled Xbox Dashboard. At some point, you may have heard a tale like this before. Maybe on a school playground, or even on a message board just like this one. You couldn't be blamed for doubting a story as sensational as this. A friend of someone's friend has a dad who works for Microsoft, and he let them play the new Halo before everyone else. But what if this story is true? What if our video's friend really did play Halo before everyone else? Let's put a pin in this for now. The wait for Halo 4 was considered a long one, at least for that era of game development. It took over five years after Halo 3 for the sequel to finally arrive and continue Master Chief's journey in 343's first turn at the helm of the franchise. While an early teaser was shown off at E3 2011, the months that followed brought little in the way of new info. Fans were eager to know what this new take on the series would look like, and the scarcity of gameplay footage left some seeking alternative means to satisfy their curiosity. Towards the start of May in 2012, a group of fans associated with the Xbox Underground group, many of whom were teenagers, used 360 dev kits to gain access to a Halo 4 prototype hidden on PartnerNet. Although Microsoft had concealed the demo and given it an extra layer of security over games available on the open PartnerNet library, the team of hackers bypassed this with ease. The de facto leader of the group, David Pecora, otherwise known as Zen Omega, had previously created his own software that could fetch the IDs linked to private demos like this and granted them access. While the outside world had hardly seen anything from the game, this band of young hackers was quietly playing it six months out from launch. Only a small number of people were invited into the circle of trust, and the group initially agreed to keep their discovery quiet, but a find this big couldn't stay secret for long. A few weeks after they had started playing Halo 4, someone with access to the prototype anonymously posted some low-quality off-screen images of it to Reddit on the 26th of May 2012. Realising that they were having their thunder stolen by an unknown individual, the group decided to stage an elaborate leak video showing the game in motion. Enter Justin May, aka MTW, a hacker associated with the Xbox Underground who had gained some notoriety for leaks of other Xbox games and an infamous incident which occurred at PAX East 2010. On the show floor that year, May was scoping out a booth for a then unreleased first person shooter game for the Xbox 360 named Breach, which was being made by Atomic Games. When the crowd around the demo units for Breach dissipated, and an Atomic employee momentarily stepped away for a bathroom break, he quickly connected his laptop to a development kit and began transferring the unreleased game. His plan was to steal the game's source code and leak it to his friends in the hacking scene. Justin was only able to grab 14 megabytes of its over 2 gigabytes contents when he was spotted by an Atomic staffer. He fled the scene, rushing through the expo, but was soon apprehended by police. Despite missing his arraignment, the 21-year-old was subsequently given lenient terms by a Boston court judge, who ordered him to surrender his computer and stay off Xbox Live for 18 months. Otherwise, he was a free man, but rather than changing his ways, May chose to return to the Xbox Underground, regaining their trust through various illegal acts and eventually becoming involved in one of the biggest leaks of the generation. It was initially posted to YouTube on the 27th of May 2012 by an account called 420xskidxblunt, aka Skidkid, which was set up by Justin May one day earlier. The video takes place in a dimly lit area and begins by displaying various online aliases belonging to different members of the Xbox Underground written down on pieces of paper, including MTW, Justin May, and Zen Omega, David Pecora. The cameraman can be seen approaching an old CRT television and inserting a Star Trek Deep Space Nine video cassette inside it, which has been taped over. The individual then films footage of the Halo 4 multiplayer demo playing on the TV from the VHS. All that can be heard during this is a song from SoundCloud rap artist Dylan Harris, aka Young Kong, the sound levels for which are set so high that it begins to distort. This track was chosen because one of the hackers went to high school with Dylan Harris. 
The video was a patchwork of nods to the Halo fandom and Xbox Underground in-jokes. For instance, it opens by playing a remix of Twisted Nerve, the whistle song from the Kill Bill soundtrack, which was once used during a 2007 leak of Halo 3 beta gameplay. The video also pays homage to Tom Morello, which was the alias adopted by a person responsible for leaking the first images of Halo Reach in 2009. No Tom Morello can be seen written on a piece of paper, and the Star Trek VHS was another tip of the hat towards this leaker, since their namesake Tom Morello, the guitarist from Rage Against the Machine, briefly appeared in an episode of Star Trek Voyager. Further amplifying the inexplicable nature of this video is the fact that hay can be seen on the ground in front of the screen, which led many people to believe it was being filmed inside a barn. It therefore became commonly known as the Halo 4 Barn Leak video. However, it wasn't filmed inside a barn at all. I know this because I tracked down the man behind the camera. His name is Gabriel Kirkpatrick. At the time, he was an 18-year-old hacker with ties to the Xbox Underground who had access to the Halo 4 multiplayer demo. The video was shot at night on the lawn outside his parents' house where he lived. In May 2012, Gabriel's parents had placed hay on the lawn around their property, a gardening technique sometimes employed to protect grass. Gabriel collected some of this hay and scattered it on the ground next to the TV to further add to the mystique. It was never his intention, he told me, for it to actually look like it was set inside a barn. Quote, We figured we wanted to be the ones to leak it and do it in a funny way. We were just all in a voice call, bouncing ideas back and forth, and it ended up with me putting some of the gameplay I had recorded onto a VHS and then taking an old TV and VCR onto my lawn to record the video. Gabriel also expanded upon how their breach of Microsoft servers worked, and revealed that the hackers who were playing the Halo 4 demo weren't just playing it with each other. Quote, We bypassed the allow list check so we could play it online. It was locked to specific accounts, but the checks were all client-side, so we just patched them out. Then we spent the next few weeks playing it online with Microsoft employees. Fans leapt on the video immediately, and a debate played out online over its authenticity. While many did recognise it as a legitimate leak from the get-go, a lot of people did not agree, with some suggesting that it was a mod of a previous Halo game. Another large camp of people, on the other hand, subscribed to the belief that it was part of an elaborate viral marketing campaign orchestrated by 343 Industries to raise interest in the new game. Some of the doubters would come around a couple of days later, when Microsoft issued a takedown notice and had the video removed from YouTube, though it was much too late to curb the leak's footprint. Video game news sites, forums and social media were set alight with speculation as to its origins, as few were aware of the Xbox Underground's existence at the time. While Gabriel and most other members of the crew kept their heads down and were generally coy about their involvement, Justin May was anything but. Under his handle MTW, he could commonly be seen boasting about his connection to the incident. In the subsequent days, he appeared on a now-deleted episode of the original Gamer podcast, where he shed some light on the video. I'm looking at that there's this very obvious viral campaign video. It's not a viral campaign. I don't think, honestly, 343 isn't that clever. They've admitted themselves it's not a viral. Then what comes to the question is, why the video the way it was? Because people, you know, they don't deserve better. They don't deserve better? Yeah, like, you know, if the video's going to be leaked, may as well do it in the most funny, entertaining way possible. The leak was big enough that Microsoft was forced to address it. They put out a statement admitting that internal Halo 4 multiplayer tests were taking place, but they had no plans for a public beta. Similar to how they responded to the Sonic 4 leak, Microsoft remotely bricked a number of dev kits that had accessed the demo without their approval, and banned any Xbox Live accounts that had been used on those IP addresses. According to Gabriel, Microsoft successfully tracked down everyone involved in the leak. The hackers later found some dummy files uploaded to Pornanet that were disguised to look like in-development DLC for Halo 4. Instead, what they found were files named after the hometowns of the hackers, such as Orono, Maine, where Gabriel was based. Rather than pursuing them through the court system, Microsoft sent a subtle warning to the group that they had been identified. 
They showed restraint on this occasion, and it's clear that some people involved in the making of Halo 4 saw the lighter side of the whole affair, such as then-franchise director Frank O'Connor. Responding to a fan on Twitter, he said, The Tom Morello bond leak is the apex of autistic leaks. It will never be topped for sheer frenetic madness. Gabriel Kirkpatrick, despite his involvement in the leak, went on to have a successful career in cybersecurity. What's more is, he even landed a job at Microsoft itself as a security software engineer. According to Gabriel, he was attending 2016's DEF CON, a hacker convention held in Las Vegas, when a Microsoft rep approached him and encouraged him to apply for a job there. This individual knew Gabriel by name due to his involvement in the Halo 4 hacks and subsequent leaks. He was told that Microsoft had maintained files on each of the hackers, but that didn't deter them from wanting to work with him. While some at Microsoft apparently had reservations given his past, he was ultimately hired to work for them. It was about a day after the leak hit YouTube back in 2012 that our video's much shared thread on the Halo forum was started, and fans began to debate its veracity. With over 10 years of hindsight, I went back to re-examine the story he told, fact-checking it with sources who had been party to the Halo 4 prototype at the time, and I found that the details they provided were correct. The gameplay specifics reflected what was in the demo, and the icon for the prototype on the Xbox was Xbox Dashboard, as they said. There was only one question remaining. Who was the person who had a father working for Microsoft? Who was our Person X? Well, I believe I have the answer to this, too. This is Armand, a former member of the Xbox Underground who goes by Armand the Cyber. He was a 16-year-old high school student at the time of the Halo 4 leak, and although he didn't have a father working at Microsoft, his mother was dating a Microsoft employee who worked at their headquarters in Redmond, Washington. I asked Armand, did he invite people over to play the secretive Halo 4 demo? I in, like I invited a lot of people from my high school to come over and play Halo 4, and and we made it like a party because Halo 4 is cool, but it's not cool by yourself. And so I had the idea to set up LAN parties months and months before the game was out. We would invite everybody from my high school and stack a full 16 lobby and just go crazy for, I mean, whole weekends at times. I can recall this happening like five different times. And everybody would be like, yo, let me get the game, let me get the game. It was always a thing. I'd be like, sorry, I can't do it. It doesn't work like that. You know, I just try to tell them. I mean, obviously all my real close friends knew how crazy I was into it. And I mean, if you were just there and got invited to the party, it's because, you know, we were at least kind of friends, you know, at school. So that was right. a big thing and that made a lot of noise. The man Armand's mother was dating was, of course, not responsible for him accessing the demo. Armand was a well-connected hacker with a plethora of 360 dev kits at his disposal. But this isn't the last you'll be hearing of this surprising familial connection in this video. While those involved in the Halo 4 leak weren't subject to legal repercussions as a result of it, it would be a different series of leak-related events that would cause the Xbox Underground to finally incur the wrath of some of gaming's biggest names. April 2010 saw the announcement of Gears of War 3, the much-anticipated conclusion to Epic's trilogy chronicling the titular Gears and their fight against a race of subterranean monsters. After a big debut on late night TV in the US, a release date was set for April 8th, 2011. That was until Microsoft changed course. Needing a major title for their holiday lineup, the game was pushed back to September 2011. Although the vast majority of it was finished on time for its original deadline, the extra five months enabled the developers to apply more polish. It was while fans were excitedly awaiting its new launch date, however, that a leak of massive proportions would occur. Back in January 2011, the official Epic Games website and forums were hacked. Little did they know at the time that this event would set in motion a domino effect, unraveling the secrets of companies across the industry. Through an SQL injection, an Xbox Underground regular from North Carolina who called himself GamerFreak1727 had manipulated Epic's site into disclosing the login details of its user base. 
Months later, in around June 2011, they passed this data onto a friend of theirs, a 15-year-old hacker from Australia named Dylan Wheeler, who went by Superday online. Dylan scanned the database for individuals of note and found passwords connected to accounts with official Epic Games email addresses. The thought occurred to Dylan, what if he tested these passwords elsewhere to see if they were reusing them on other sites? He tried this multiple times and eventually found someone doing just that, an Epic Games IT administrator no less. These were forum accounts belonging to actual Epic Games employees. Dylan entered this employee's personal Gmail account, searched through his emails, and found the login information for their internal Epic Games account. He was able to VPN his way into an Epic Games server and log in using the admin's details, but before going further, he made the decision to reach out to David Pecora. Dylan Wheeler had been distantly admiring Pecora's Xbox hacks for some time, and hoped that presenting him with this discovery would be his ticket into the group's inner circle. Pecora was fascinated. For these hackers, Epic's internal hub was a gateway to all kinds of unreleased software, but he needed someone who could extract material like that unnoticed. He reached out to another hacker called Sonic, real name Sonod Neshawat, who owned a hacked Comcast cable modem. This allowed him to connect to Epic servers and download their contents anonymously. After searching through their file directories, the group hit upon a huge discovery the source code for Gears of War 3. David Pecora was keen to get his hands on a build of it, but rather than transferring the sensitive data over the internet, Sinan decided to burn Gears of War 3 to a series of Blu-ray discs and send them through the post in a package labelled Wedding Videos to avoid suspicion. The parcel arrived safely at David Pecora's house, who was then able to play through the entirety of Gears of War 3 months before its official street date. Many visual elements remained unfinished, but structurally the whole game was in place for them to play. It was shared among a small group of people in the Xbox Underground who agreed to keep the discovery quiet. Eventually, however, it was given to Justin May, the person who would go on to become involved in the Halo 4 leak. Days later, towards the start of July 2011, the stolen build of Gears 3 surfaced on torrenting sites and it became a major news story. While rooting through emails belonging to the aforementioned Epic Games worker in the following days, the Xbox Underground crew discovered correspondence between Epic and federal law enforcement. The incident was now being investigated by the FBI, who had examined Epic's computers for signs of intrusion, but had yet to find anything incriminating. Later that month, on July 19th, 2011, David Pecora began to panic that the leaks would be traced back to him. He asked his co-conspirators for help with encrypting hard drives in an effort to conceal his activities. I need your help, I'm going to get arrested, he wrote. One day later, discussing the data taken from Epic servers, he told them, If we ever go disappearing, just upload it to the internet and say, fuck you Epic, if they ever go after us. Dylan Wheeler, on the other hand, was undeterred and continued digging deeper into Epic's network. He used his access to monitor the company's development processes, occasionally going so far as to spy on meetings through their webcams. He even got inside lead designer Cliff Bozinski's computer and took a peek at his mixtape. Wheeler then turned his attention towards Epic's Unreal Developer Network. This was their portal for the many developers all over the world who were licensing their Unreal Engine, where they could learn how to use it, download documentation, and ask Epic staff for help. Each developer had their own login for the network, and Wheeler reasoned that if he could obtain the passwords associated with their accounts, it would open up countless new possibilities for the hackers. He got to work and eventually located a database of email addresses and partially revealed passwords. These were passed along to David Pecora, who used password cracking software to decrypt a number of the passwords. The group tried to reuse this login information elsewhere and found some success. They were able to log into various accounts on Microsoft's Xbox developer portal used by people publishing games on Xbox platforms. 
From there, they noticed that many developers were using Scaleform, a piece of Flash-based software from a company called Autodesk for designing user interfaces and HUDs for games. Scaleform had its own forums where developers could discuss the software and submit queries. Dylan Wheeler and co decided to try logging into it using the same information obtained from Epic, and again, it worked. Not only that, they had gained access to an admin account. They were able to use this account to obtain another database of login information, this time from Scaleform, and cracked some of its passwords. Obtaining the initial login details from Epic was the group's ace in the hole. They were able to hop from site to site, reusing passwords, to gain access to developer accounts over and over again. But it was cracking the Scaleform passwords in particular that enabled them to unleash havoc. They now had passwords linked to staff from some of the biggest companies in the industry, like Electronic Arts, Bungie, Microsoft, Blizzard and Activision. When David Pecora was able to enter Valve's network in late September 2011, they were able to claim their next prize, a pre-release version of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. The game wasn't due out for another two months, but it had been submitted to Valve in preparation for its release on Steam. With the assistance of Justin May, Pecora and the others were able to download it and play through the full game. This pattern of reusing the cracked passwords across different developer portals continued for years to come. In 2012, the group used this method to hack into Zombie Studios, best known for the Spec Op games, who were developing simulators for the United States Army. They used their access to steal an official Apache helicopter simulator. This audacious stunt, however, would pale in comparison to their next one. In the summer of 2012, the group turned its attention towards Microsoft, who was in the process of developing their next console, the Xbox One, known internally at the time as Durango. The hackers used their ever-expanding list of developer accounts to download information and software related to this new system, to the point at which they were able to create a virtual machine capable of running its development software. Then they found tech specs and even instructions for assembling one of these devices. They decided that they would use this knowledge to build their own Durango. One of the hackers, Holly Leroux, agreed to acquire and assemble the parts themselves, which they did successfully. They were now the only members of the public to effectively own a Durango. It was limited in terms of what it could actually do, but they were keenly aware of the massive public interest that would surround the device if word got out. Xbox underground figureheads like David Bacora and Dylan Wheeler therefore decided that they would begin manufacturing and selling their own counterfeit Durangos. It didn't take long for them to find a buyer through Assembler Games, a collector from the Seychelles, an island in East Africa, who bought their first unit for 5,000 US dollars. Justin May, who was an adept scammer, had worked out a way to exploit the US Postal Service for low-cost shipping. On the 9th of August 2012, he volunteered to travel to LaRoe's house, take the device off her hands, and ship it himself using this method. Not content with this, Dylan Wheeler began leaking the existence of the Durango online starting in late July 2012. Dylan, who was then just 16 years old, had access to this information and hardware before almost anyone else, and wanted the world to know that. Under his alias Super Day, he released pictures of the counterfeit dev kit, Durango software, and a sample image from the new Kinect. Then he went a step beyond that. Using the images taken of the first machine that Holly Leroux had constructed, he listed a counterfeit Durango for sale on eBay on the 12th of August 2012. Dylan had been accessing this content for months, and finally wanted some recognition for pulling off some of the most bold video game leaks of all time. While the games media scrambled to make sense of these events, another collector stepped forward and agreed to pay Wheeler over $20,000 for a Durango, but that wouldn't happen. The eBay listing was a bluff. Wheeler did not actually have access to another Durango. The first one had been expensive to build, and so the crew didn't bother. For Wheeler, the sale was a ploy for attention rather than money, and on that count, it had delivered. His following grew, and press outlets approached him for answers. GameSpot, for instance, asked him why he was doing all of this, and he told them, quote, YOLO. He now had the eyes of the world on him, and this was exactly what some people in the scene had been trying to avoid. Among the Xbox Underground, the eBay listing was more than a little divisive. 
People like David Pecora and Sonard Neshawat began distancing themselves from Dylan Wheeler and some left the group altogether. They had kept their operations quiet for years and this brought them a lot of unwanted attention. Their illegal activities continued but became much less frequent. In 2013, one hacker named Austin Alcala used crack credentials from their previous intrusions to log into Kuju Entertainment's network and steal a pre-release build of 2014's Thief. The group's last big score, however, would arrive in September of 2013. From 2012 to 13, their Durango leaks had escalated again and again. First, it was entering Microsoft servers and stealing information on it. Then they took its software and got that running. And finally, they used stolen blueprints to build and sell their own Durango. The only thing that could possibly top that, they imagined, would be getting their hands on an official Microsoft-made Durango or Xbox One developer kit. This was when Armand the Cyber came into the equation. Armand was 18 years old by this point, living at home near Redmond, Washington, not far from Microsoft's headquarters. He'd become friendly with a lot of people in the scene, like Austin Alcala. They would exchange tips on hacking Xbox games and on occasion leaked early builds of upcoming titles. Armand was living with his mother at the time, who, as previously mentioned, was in a relationship with a Microsoft employee who worked at their Redmond headquarters. This man would visit Armand's home regularly after work. He'd hang up his coat and leave the employee badge used to access Microsoft's buildings unattended. One day in 2012, Armand got an idea. He acquired an RFID cloning device and produced a copy of this employee badge. Over the following year, he used it to explore Microsoft's vast Redmond campus on multiple occasions. He would walk the grounds and scope out its buildings. Then, in 2013, he hatched a plan. He spoke to Austin Alcala and told him he could get an official Microsoft Durango or Xbox One development kit a step above what even they'd been able to grasp. Armand negotiated access to Microsoft's developer portal with Alcala and used it to pull building schematics. He learned the layout of their campus and where exactly the devices were being stored. Armand knew how to hack, but he was also highly proficient in bypassing physical security. Utilizing his expertise in both, he plotted to steal the next Xbox from Microsoft. On a night in September 2013, he made his way into their headquarters under the cover of darkness. Some employees, he told me, were still working as they prepared for the launch of the Xbox One. No, I mean, it, there was definitely still people working at that time. I mean, they're, they're trying to push out a product. There's people working, you know, overtimes and night, but it was uh, where, where I went and, and the level that I was going, I, I knew that there was going to be nobody there. Armand quickly located the building containing the Durangos and made his way inside. Yeah, so I had to take a lockpick kit with me to, you know, get through basic locks. I don't want to disclose too much because I don't want to give a tutorial of how to break into Microsoft. Join me for my DEF CON talk on that one. <laughs> After searching through the empty building, Armand found what he was looking for. He grabbed a Durango, stuffed it into his bag, quietly exited the campus completely unnoticed. No alarms, no witnesses. It was only successful because uh, we had breached them digitally. You know, I had, I had more intel. Armand had burgled Microsoft without getting caught. He returned home, tested the kit out, and shared his findings with his friends in the Xbox Underground. In terms of leaks and exploits, it doesn't get more brazen than walking into a console maker's headquarters, stealing their in-development next machine, and showing it to your friends. But Armand was about to do it all over again. Not long after his first infiltration of Microsoft's hub, Armand was in communication with David Pecora and Austin Alcala. According to Armand, the two pressured him into perpetrating another burglary to retrieve more Durango units. The two hackers transferred Armand a few thousand dollars in exchange for his cooperation. And so, he went back, repeated his process, and successfully extracted two more Durangos. A week after Armand shipped the devices off, he received a call from Microsoft, but not for the reason you might expect. Days prior to stealing from them, Armand had applied for a quality assurance position at Microsoft's Redmond branch. They were calling him to offer him the job, and he accepted. He was now employed at the very place he had just burgled. Days went by, then weeks. 
Armand was working at Microsoft without any issues, and they hadn't even noticed the devices were missing. What did you think was going to happen? Did you did you think you could get away with it? Yeah, no, I for sure thought I could get away with it. So you, you just thought you, you you thought you would take them and and they wouldn't figure out who did it. Well, I thought that maybe they'd figure out, but maybe they wouldn't care. We were desensitized with these things because we've seen so much, so many Xboxes go in and out, and we know how many go in and out of a place like that. And we know you can't really keep your eyes on everything. A whole month had passed since Armand's Xbox One heist. He was working at Microsoft, and it was going well, when the company finally noticed what had happened. The campus was placed under lockdown, security was tightened, and an investigation began into who was responsible. However, the initial panic over the incident settled after a couple of weeks. The lockdown was raised, and Armand continued as though nothing had happened. Then one day during work hours, he was summoned into a back room by a Microsoft supervisor. He had been identified as the thief in question via CCTV footage, and was interrogated by Microsoft staff as a result. He was fired and subsequently arrested by police. Armand, in an attempt to cooperate with authorities, begged David Pecora and Austin Alcala to return the stolen devices, and they obliged. Armand was later charged with burglary and given a one-year suspended sentence, which he served without incident. The Microsoft employee whose badge he used for his break-in remained employed by the company, as they were deemed not to have been complicit in any way. Armand's arrest marked the beginning of the end for the Xbox Underground. In the following years, the community scattered, and its figureheads were apprehended by authorities. In 2014, David Pecora attempted to cross the US border from Canada and was arrested for his involvement in the Epic Games and Activision hacks, among many others. One year later, the 22-year-old was sentenced to 18 months in prison after pleading guilty to criminal copyright infringement and conspiracy to commit fraud. Austin Alcala, for his role in the same crimes, was arrested in January 2014 and faced the same charges. It emerged that he had maintained a database of over 11,000 sets of usernames and passwords stolen during their exploits. Alcala avoided prison time by cooperating with federal agents to bring down another group of hackers who'd been stealing millions of dollars worth of in-game currency from EA's FIFA games. He was later sentenced to three years of probation. Sonard Neshawat, who had assisted in hacks such as the Epic Games breach, was arrested the same year and, like Bakora, was later given 18 months in prison. One of the only major players in the Xbox Underground to evade law enforcement was Dylan Wheeler. The teenager was charged by Australian police in March 2015, but fled the country, flying to the Czech Republic before his sentencing. In his absence, his mother Anne Wheeler was sentenced to two years in prison for helping him escape. The Xbox Underground finally faced its reckoning, but what none of them realised initially was that it was brought down from the inside. From early on in their activities, an informant for the FBI was among them, collecting evidence and manipulating events. This enigmatic figure was instrumental in building the state's case against the hackers. The individual went anonymous throughout court proceedings, being listed only as Person A. However, former members of the group are certain of the informant's identity, and there is plenty of evidence to support these suspicions. Remember how the group's homemade Xbox One prototype was intended to be sent to a buyer in the Seychelles? Well, they never received it. After it was given to Justin May, it disappeared. FBI documents indicate that it was handed off to them in Delaware by Person A. The only member of the Xbox Underground known to be from Delaware was Justin May. When David Pecora was arrested crossing the US border, he was on his way to pick up a car part from an online friend in Delaware. That friend was Justin May. One of the only central figures in the Xbox Underground to avoid prosecution was Justin May. Wired.com reached out to him in 2018 to find out whether or not he was person A, and he told them, quote, Can't comment on that, sorry. Some claim that after getting caught stealing from PAX back in 2010, he offered to become an informant in exchange for a more favourable deal. Among the group, there had been suspicions about May for years, but he succeeded in embedding himself by routinely committing criminal acts. May was a prolific scammer. He was not only swindling the post office, but a long list of tech companies through warranty scams. 
he would trick auction site sellers into sending him the serial numbers of devices like Kindles and iPads after feigning an interest in buying them. Then he would submit the serials to tech support services, telling them the device was defective and getting them to send him a brand new one as a replacement. He would collect these from an abandoned house he registered as his address, before selling them online, a fraudulent scheme that proved highly lucrative for him. Law enforcement turned a blind eye to May's activities for years as he proved a useful ally in dismantling the Xbox Underground, but he eventually outlived his usefulness to them. He only increased the volume of his scams in the years after the group was dissolved, and this was something the FBI was no longer willing to overlook. In 2021, he was convicted for a lengthy series of warranty scams dating back to 2016, along with a host of financial crimes like tax evasion and money laundering. He had scammed companies such as Amazon, Cisco and Microsoft and made over $3.5 million doing it. Justin May was given a prison sentence of 7 years and 8 months and ordered to pay more than $4 million in restitution. When I spoke to Armand the Cyber, one of the first questions I asked him was where his fascination with the world of Xbox hacking and leaks came from. He told me about how as a kid growing up not far from Microsoft, he would on occasion get opportunities to focus test games in the works long before they would release. Uh, before I got my first taste of actually hacking games before they were getting out and getting them, I was actually getting to test them by Microsoft, they were giving me to them. And kind of seeing that games were in development and stuff like that. I always loved the games that were in development more than the final game. Like I always remembered the in development gaming memories versus the final game. So like that kind of always stuck with me too as a kid. It was this excitement of having exclusive access to something before everyone else that he would continue to chase for years to come. I recognized a small part of myself in what he was describing. I too knew the excitement of obtaining something the rest of the world had yet to see, whether it's uncovering console games or something yet to be announced. It was a particularly potent feeling when I could get my hands on something that I knew a company didn't want me to. But Armand's story and stories like it show us how far some are willing to go in pursuit of that rush. That's something that many of these stories have in common. Aside from one or two folks like Gabriel Kirkpatrick who ended up working at Microsoft, almost none of these people's lives benefited in any material way from these leaks and hacks. Almost none of them made any money in the end or succeeded in leveraging their notoriety to their benefit. People like Harman and many other members of the Xbox Underground were in it for the thrill. They did it because they loved getting to see games and technology before everyone else, and on occasion, they enjoyed sharing their finds to show the world that they were smart enough to pull it off. They did it even at the expense of their own features. Lives were torn apart doing this. Some of them lost jobs, received criminal records, some even went to prison, or largely in pursuit of a fleeting high. Today, Armand, like many of his friends from back then, is more than a little regretful for his actions. Yeah, um, definitely don't do what I do. <laughs> Let me just say that. Since the events of 2013, Armand has turned his life around and has pledged to use his skills for good. He began operating a computer security company named The Good Hackers, who work to protect businesses from all manner of cybersecurity threats. Video game leaks like these will continue to happen, but the Wild West era of the Xbox Underground is over. Companies across the industry have tightened security over the years, and Microsoft shut down PartnerNet after the Xbox 360 generation. Their development environment has since become much more locked down, following the string of major leaks it once enabled. I want to end on an observation made by Pixelbots, who was a recurring part of this video that I found hard to argue with. Quote, what personally gets me is that, despite all the security vulnerabilities around, efforts to exploit it all and protect against it, the fact the human element ends up being the hardest to defend against is easily my favourite." End quote. There's some truth to that. Whether it's human error, disgruntled employees, or curious hackers that lead to these leaks, what all of these incidents have in common is that companies simply cannot account for that human element. Tighter security or not, leaks are inevitable.